This video is made possible by CodeNotary.io, tamper-proof notarization for all your digital objects. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Moshix mainframe channel. This is Moshix. And today is the last day of Hanukkah and Christmas was just a couple of days ago. And one of our most loyal and longest standing mainframe, Moshix mainframe channel members, uh, Michael of Richmond, has sent me this today. As you can see, it's a rendering on a 3270 emulator of both a, a menorah and of a Christmas tree. Today is the last day of Hanukkah and, um, and he sent it to me just in time so I could show this to you today on our um, video. And he made this, uh, the nice thing about this application is that, or this screen is that it's made completely in Rex. As you know, uh, in November I released a video about Rex version 2 for MVS 3.8, the 24-bit version that we use as part of the TK4 distribution. And if you go um, to the examples that, to the code that uh, Michael sent me, well, should have here at the bottom, where is it? Ah, uh, here it is. So here's the code for it. One of the things that Peter Jacob and Mike Grossman added to the version 2 of Brex or Rex for MBS 3.8 was the ability to use colors and address the screen in an intelligent fashion. And so Michael sat down and painstakingly uh, wrote the whole uh, screen that you just saw in Rex. It's just a number of calls. Uh, obviously, these are expensive calls in terms of overhead for MBS, but uh, that's okay because nowadays uh, MIPS is not the thing we lack when it comes down to uh, MBS. We lack bits. We lack exactly uh, seven bits from 24 bit to 31 bit, but we don't lack MIPS. And so that's okay. And so he wrote um, this thing here and he uses the colors and uh, he sent it to me. And since today was kind of the last day we could sh still show this, I was excited to uh, show this on this channel. And I asked him if he could share it with me, which he did. And here it is. We've run it and uh, we have this beautiful screen. And this is just an example of the many things that we can still do with a 35, 37, 38 year old operating system such as MVS 3.8 and VM 370. So more power to the community and thank you very much, Michael Richmond, as well as also may thank you very much to Mike Rossman and Peter Jacob, both in Germany, who made uh, Rex 2.0 possible with the features here that Michael is using. So uh, the reason I'm making this video today is that I get often, I mean, not every day, but I get, uh, I want to say at least uh, two or three times a month, I get emails, how can we prepare our beloved MVS 3.0 Eight as delivered by TK4 to allow for more users to connect to it and have more screens available. Um, so today I'm going to show you how to do that. If you know our TK4, you know that there is an amount of users that is actually limited for a mainframe. And what I mean is that if you go and look at um, the Parmlib and we browse this, there's going, to, there's going to be a few places where we can see um, how many users are able to use the system. And <clears throat> so in TSO key 00, zero or whatever the concatenation is that you're using, you will have user max. Now, um, some people just go and change that from 40 to 80, let's say, which is still not a lot, right? I mean, on a mainframe with the processing power, of the of a modern computer on which MVS 3.8 is emulated on, we could have many hundreds of users more than we were able to do back in the 80s. I remember back in the 80s, I was uh, as a programmer, and we had an IBM 3083 with 16 megabytes of memory, one processor, and we had about 3,000 Kix users, about 150, I think 150 programmers on TSO. And we had a, a production kicks and the test kicks all in one machine. And when the processor was running at 60%, we 
people were saying, well, we still have 40%. <laughs> Nowadays, when the machine is running at 30%, they panic and go buy a faster processor. Back then, people were saying, well, we bought it to use it at 100%. <laughs> Why would we um, go buy another computer just because we're running at 60%? Uh, the response time was everything back then. And so as long as you could still maintain a predictable and pretty much invariant response time, people were adding more and more users to the same machine. So we can, you know, one place to change how many users can connect, obviously, is here. Um, and um, that's one place where you can change how many users are able to log in. There's some other places as well. Um, where is that? Hold on a second. Yeah, term max. Here's another place. So um, here we indicate how many terminals can connect maximally. And there's one more place. Let me see here. Mm. Nope. That actually may be all. So um, I think if we update these two members, then we should be able to uh, have more users. Yeah. Now the big question is always, uh, well, if you have more users, then we'll also need more terminal. Uh, lines attached to the system that will, in which users can connect on and that is actually the more the difficult part in getting this um, up and running and so there are several places that we need to go to to uh, add more terminals so for that we need to go to the sys1 libraries if you go all the way to the bottom you will see there is a couple of uh, partition data sets that deal with VTAM, which, which is the, the system, the subsystem through which we connect to TSO. And you'll see that um, there is here several configuration files. These are uh, object files and deal with lines, which we don't concerned with. But we'll go here into sys1.vtam list and even um, normal um, lines need to be configured. They're, they're just on demand. You need to define them to VTAM. So to VTAM, what you need to define is 3274s, which, is, which are communication controllers, which are controlled by VTAM. And so now for every terminal, and this is how, by the way, it used to be back in, in the old days when we had SNA uh, connections to, to, the, um, to the mainframe, now you need to have, for every terminal, you need to have a stanza here. And so if you want to add more terminals, you would need at this point to add um, so oops, I'm still in VM mode. Okay, so pay attention here because 3277s, these are screens, 3286 are different kind of terminals, and those are printers. So we want we want to be able to copy things like this over here. And then we have to go further. So we're going to here call it here 8 CU0CU0 C8, C8. And of course we also need to change it here. And and then what we're telling it is what is the login application that's going to be presented to that screen. So in theory you could have for a group of screen different logon screens than for others. And uh, that's how sometimes uh, mainframes used to be set up so the developers would see certain logon screens and other users would see different kind of logon screens. So if you repeat this then um, a bunch of times uh, what's wrong here? Mm. So I'm still in VM. I've been doing too much VM, and so my ISPF skills have atrophied. So we could do this now again a number of times. And, um, and again, always adapting here the addresses. And if you don't want to change the logon screen that's presented, you do it like this. So uh, for the number of screens that you think you will need, and and then we save that. And um, 
you don't have to deal with this kind of uh, addresses here but now once we've done that what you do is go to the object um, PDS partition data set called sys1.vtam object and so these are the assembled because what we're really doing here when we edit vtam the list the the source code file these are macro assemblers so we're just um, lines so we're really just adding lines of macro assembler which then later on the assembler will turn into object files and so the object files are stored here and if I show you this you'll see that it's just it's just a it's just a binary it's an object file and to be able to force the IPL procedure to create a new object file with the new terminal lines that we added we actually have to delete the old one and if we delete it then upon IPL the machine will go and recreate uh, the new object file and now you'll have the additional uh, terminals and so um, I think you know I have I have an instance on the Google Cloud as you know with uh, with MVS and I had I think at the peak maybe about 250 270 users there and obviously this is all hobby and not professional but I would say for a hobbyist network you should plan maybe about 5 to 15 percent of the terminals compared to the number of users you have defined so if you have 300 users I think um, somewhere between uh, 20 and um, you know and 40 terminals is the peak that I have seen being used. I added I think about 40 terminals and I never get a, got a complaint about a user wanting to log on and no terminals being available. And of course I also upped the, the number of, um, of uh, max users in the Sys1 Parmalip as we just saw in the beginning here, right? Um, here, I increased the user max to 80. And if a lot of people then are compiling and doing work, one more thing you may have to do is increase the number of initiators and maybe even job classes. So, um, oops. So in the in the just two parameters, you also have the number of initiators. Uh, initiators are just empty shells of jobs waiting to get attached to some kind of real job and then start executing. And um, so in my cloud system, I defined two additional initiators, uh, one for high. Um, for high uh, priority jobs by the system administrators or system programmers and then one for the general population and and so um, if you need more um, initiators that's where you will also define more initiators one more thing i did is as you know i usually run my mvs 3.8 with two cpus i know that jürgen winkelman the maintainer of tk4 he doesn't bother with it he runs everything with one CPU. I've never personally had one single problem with two CPUs. I've, I've been running them for years with two CPUs and never had an issue. And MVS 3.8 was safe for two CPUs. And in fact, I worked for a while on a mainframe uh, which had two CPUs and with MVS and that worked just fine. So uh, these are the things that you would have to consider adding initiators. Of course, increasing the maximum user count for um, in the Sys1 Parmlib. And then, if you really have that many users, you will also need um, more VTAM screen definitions or terminal definitions, as we just saw. Having said all that, um, I have to say that when I stress tested my MVS 3.8, I actually reached the, 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 the maximum capacity for my system at around 50 users. And I looked into it, how is it possible that on a machine that's much, much faster than the mainframes we had back 35 years ago, I'm not able to run as many users. And the reason for that is that you need to remember that the MVS that we have here is MVS 3.8. It's not, it's not MVS SP. Um, if you look at the history of MVS, you will see that we use the free open source MVS 3.8 but um, actually most commercial 
um, shops back even in 35 years ago they were running MVSSP. MVSSP had stuff like Rec F, it had a much more advanced VTEM, it had uh, better everything and so uh, those systems were highly tuned there were there were significant changes to the uh, source code of the of the nucleus of the operating system that you could actually achieve much higher throughput rates so as long as we keep in mind that we're not really running uh, the commercial version of MBS we're running the open source version of MBS and all the goodness that IBM put into SP is largely missing such as Rex of course such as uh, a modern VTAM, such as better compilers, all that kind of stuff is working. So we, in a way, run the slowest possible MBS, and that's why I reached a uh, 50 user peak uh, on a much, much faster mainframe, even when emulated, than the mainframe from 35 years ago. But if you want to add terminals, this would be the way to do it. And um, remember that when you IPL, because we deleted the object file for the VTAM definitions, you will have to do a CLPA IPL, which means cold, um, a cold IPL of the machine, so that the uh, uh, so that the link pack area is going to be reformatted by the operating system, and that's when the new object file is going to be regenerated from source. So just remember, um, the last step will be to re-IPL with a cold um, cold format of the of the um, LPA of the link pack area which is different than a cold IPL of Jest 2 right those are two different things but um, this is how I do it and uh, I've never had any problems with my MBS in the cloud it runs nicely and um, and so I can only highly recommend it and um, as far as getting the code for the Hanukkah and Christmas tree from Michael Richmond assuming that he is fine with me posting it um, here I will put in the description below this video with the source code for uh, for the um, for the uh, for the Hanukkah and Christmas tree so maybe you can use it next year or something like that I think I have it here I'm just gonna kill this machine for now and oops I have it uh, let me see here T34 oh no actually it's already mm. No, it's sorry, it's actually here. So, where is it? Yeah, so I'm gonna put this whole program in the description below this video or point to it, and um, and then you can uh, import it with the terminal emulator or with FTP or whatever, and you can have fun running it on your MPS. Runs just fine, as long as you have Rex version 2.0, the one that I have a video um, on my channel for. Let's go see which one that is, YouTube. No shakes. Okay. Let's see videos. Mm. Yeah. So that will be video uh, one M one fifty four, where we show Rex with VSAM, and one of the I did mention the new screen formatting capabilities of the new Rex version, but uh, it's not in the title, but it's in the video. So we're gonna go and watch this video on how to install uh, Rex version 2.0, where to obtain it from. Obviously here we have the repository by Mike Grossman. And uh, and then you can run uh, our little uh, screen drawing program. And I'm sure that people are gonna come up, be creative and come up with other new and, and interesting uh, screens that they can do with, uh, with this uh, Rex version of MBS. Uh, it should probably even work. Well, I don't know if it's going to work on VM because the thermal definitions macros are different. I'm sure it could be made to work, but uh, this is for now MVS only. By the way, one of the things that we also did uh, lately is on my Moshix uh, channel on YouTube, uh, Facebook Moshix. <clears throat> I polled people and I asked if they wanted to see more uh, more videos about uh, my my favorite topic right now, HNet, or about VM or about um, MVS. And I think the response was pretty uh, clear that people wanted to see more um, people wanted to see more MVS videos, and so this is one of those. And um, and um, 
So a fast response to the very clear uh, request for more <laughs> MBS videos from the from the folks on the uh, Facebook Moshe Explain from Channel page. So that's it. Um, I hope you had a good time watching this video, learn something. And if you have any questions, please do uh, post them as comments below this video. If you like this particular video, nice, short and sweet, then please do press on the thumbs up button. And uh, otherwise, I'll see you for the next video soon. Thank you very much and goodbye.